everybody. This is Billy Reamer with DBHR, uh, and we're going to go ahead and get started because it's right at one o'clock. It looks like we've got about 30 folks who have joined us. Um, if you are able to hear me and are familiar with this, if you can go ahead and just raise your hand real quick, make sure everything's working. Awesome. Bunch of hands going up and you can put those back down. So we'll go over how to raise your hand if you're new here, uh, and that'll be in the upcoming slide. So we ask that you try to join by phone audio if possible. The uh, webinar audio gets a little funky, and particularly this week we're noticing some issues with lots and lots of people uh, using these platforms uh, that sometimes the audio can get a little wonky. So if you're able to call in, um, you can use the information on the screen, you can use the information from your confirmation email, or you can click on your audio pane tab uh, on the right hand side, which we'll go over in just a minute. So uh, we're going to move on to the next slide and talk about what some of those panes look like. So here is how to navigate the webinar if you're new to this platform. Um, you've got your grab tab, which will minimize and maximize. So if the things are sticking out there covering up the screen and the slides, you can just click that arrow and that'll uh, minimize the whole screen off to the edge. Um, you've got your audio pane. That's where you can change between computer and phone audio, uh, and it'll give you specific call-in information and passcodes for this information. We'll go over the hand in a minute, uh, but uh, that is located there. And then you can also look at who else is there. And then the last one is the question pane. So uh, because we don't have chat boxes, any questions that you have, you can type into that question pane. Uh, and folks can access that there. So as I look at that, I see we have one question in the question pane saying that the uh, audio, the access code that was given does not work. So the first thing I would say is please double check your confirmation registration email and make sure you're using the correct one because we have a lot of these uh, that are out there. Um, and I've had a couple of folks try to use the incorrect one. Uh, that being said, uh, I can confirm for you real quick that the audio pin, for those of you that want to jot it down real quick, uh, I will give here in a second. That access code is 9454438058 pound. And if you're having any issues with that, go ahead and shoot me an email. It's billy.reamer at hca.wa.gov and we get that sorted on the back end. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide because this is how you ask questions in person, which is to raise your hand. It can be a little counterintuitive. Um, so if the, the green arrow is there, that means your hand is down. And if the red arrow is there, that means your hand is up. Another way to think of that is if you click the green arrow, your hand will go up. And if you click the red arrow, your hand will go down. Um, and so it can be a little counterintuitive. Uh, and I see a couple of folks that have their hands raised. So unless you want me to call on you uh, and bring you up, you might want to put those down. Oh, there they all go. Perfect. Good practice. Uh, so now I'm going to say thank you to everybody for being here. I'm going to transition to the next slide and turn it over to uh, Jennifer Hogue, who's our supervisor for the mental health promotion, uh, behavioral health integration section, and she's going to be our presenter today. So go ahead, Jen. Thank you, Billy. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so happy you joined me today to discuss COVID-19 and suicide prevention, staying connected and promoting resources. Like Billy said, my name is Jen Hogue and I'm a supervisor at DBHR overseeing the mental health promotion and integration services. And we are recording this session. Today's objectives are to define the protective factor of connectedness, review digital resources for DBHR approved programs, review safe messaging guidelines for social media, and identify ways people can connect while social distancing. But first, let's take a moment to truly transition to this time together by taking a mindful pause. I invite you now to place your feet flat on the floor and sit in a comfortable but upright position. First, just noticing how does your body feel right now? Just checking in. And if you wish, you can close your eyes 
or you can softly gaze them down a few feet in front of you. And just feel your physical body. We've been moving from meeting to meeting or task to task. And let's take a moment to breathe and come into this moment, leaving the previous tasks in the background for now. Turning your attention to your body and your breath. Just breathe normally. And now take a deep, nourishing breath, inhaling the lungs, feeling that expansion of the breath, and then release it. What is here for you right now? Maybe you're feeling tired, maybe excited. Whatever you are feeling, just notice for the moment. And now take another deep breath. Noticing the physical sensa sensations of breathing. Maybe you'll notice a little tension release. One more time, inhale and let it go. Even something simple like taking three deep breaths can be just that moment of pause you may need in your day. So remember and take pause, coming back to your breath whenever you remember. Now let's get started. I want to encourage you all to take care of yourself during our discussion today. I don't know how suicide has touched any of you, although I'm pretty confident to say that it, it has touched us all personally in some way. Now let's talk about risk and protective factors. Suicide is associated with several risk and protective factors. It's connected to other forms of injury and violence and causes serious health and economic consequences. For example, suicide risk is higher among people who have experienced violence, including child abuse, bullying, or sexual violence. Other characteristics associated with suicide include a history of suicide attempts and lack of problem solving skills. The two strongest predictors of suicide risk are mental illness and substance use disorder. The CDC and other experts identify the risk factors shown on this slide. However, two people with the same behavioral health disorder or trauma history could have very different health outcomes. What makes the difference is a question, key question in research. But we must remember that even for a person with several risk factors, suicide is not inevitable. Protective factors, skills and characteristics that lessen the impact of risk, do not necessarily make risk factors go away. Instead, they may give a person the skills or supports to get through difficulties with their health and wellness intact. Protective factors like connectedness and easy access to healthcare buffer individuals from suicidal thoughts and behavior. By addressing risk and protective factors, suicide can be prevented. Today, we are going to focus on the protective factor of connectedness. So let's talk about connectedness and suicide. What is connectedness? The degree to which a person or group is socially close, interrelated, or shares resources with other persons or groups. Connectedness is prompted, promoted as a protective factor to prevent suicide and includes community-wide intervention and programs. Connectedness can include connection between individuals, friends, neighbors, coworkers, family, 
community organizations like schools or faith communities, the connection of groups to their cultural traditions and history. Connectedness and social support can be enhanced through social programs directed at specific groups, such as older adults or LGBTQ youth, as well as through activities that support the development of positive and supportive communities. Social support and connection are key protective factors against suicide. Positive and supportive social relationships and community connections can help buffer the effect of risk factors in people's lives. Programs and practices that promote social connectedness and support are one element of a comprehensive approach to suicide prevention. What does connectedness mean? Supporting the development of relationships between youth and positive adults in their lives, such as their teachers or coaches or neighbors. The key there is positive adults. Help build positive attachment between families and organizations in communities, such as schools and tribal and faith-based organizations. Implement activities in educational institutions that help students increase and strengthen their social network and connections. It's important to, re to remember that not all social connections are healthy. Suicide prevention programs should promote programs and practices leading to a positive and supportive relationship. Engaging in data-driven st strategic planning can help you assess your needs and assets, set goals, review possible program options, and determine which interventions fit your situation and desired outcomes. Here is the CDC suicide prevention strategies. One of the key recommendations in the Washington State Suicide Prevention Plan is to create and maintain programs improving connectedness, focusing on high priority populations, and groups experiencing serious stressors. This is our focus today. Promoting connectedness among individuals and within communities through modeling peer norms and enhancing community engagement may protect against suicide. Peer norm programs seek to normalize protective factors for suicide, such as help seeking, reaching out, and talking to trusted adults and promote peer connectedness. By leveraging the leadership qualities and social influence of peers, these approaches can be used to shift group level beliefs and promote positive social and behavioral change. These approaches typically target youth and are delivered in school settings, but also can be implemented in the community setting. Community engagement approaches may involve community members participating in a range of activities that increases connection, awareness, and decreases stigma. These activities provide opportunities for community members to become more involved in the community, learn about their part in suicide prevention, gain knowledge of how to intervene, learn it's okay to talk about mental health and suicide, and to connect with other community members, organizations, and resources. Potential outcomes of peer norm programs and community engagement strategies are increases in healthy coping attitudes and behaviors, referrals for youth in distress, help-seeking behaviors, and positive perceptions of adult support. Okay, let, let's look at the programs that are on DBHR's approved list of suicide prevention, such as Sources of Strength, Coping and Support Training, otherwise known as CAST, and Question, Persuade, Refer, or QPR. Sources of Strength developers responded quickly to schools moving to an online format in response to COVID-19 and have online resources for their website for those implementing sources of strength. 
They hope that in these unusual times, these resources will be a source of hope, help, and strength to you and your team. These resources consist of daily activities, journals, self-care resources, peer leader meetings, classroom resources, and games. QPR has approved the community trainings to be provided virtually. They state, to protect the integrity of the program and to maintain the fidelity of training, the standard QPR gatekeeper training for suicide prevention may be delivered via teleconference or webinar during the coronavirus restrictions. To maintain quality standards, ensure that every QPR gatekeeper receives a booklet and card, which is shared with an average of five significant others. They are temporarily making available an electronic version during the pandemic. This edition of the QPR booklet can be purchased, downloaded, and printed as needed. They also have created a QPR gatekeeper self-assessment tool for those trained via webinar. CAST also has online resources for their program. Please contact them directly to get more information. The program materials are not available on their public site. For any current customers, folks who have been trained and or purchased materials, they are offering digital access to these materials while schools are closed and the restrictions on gatherings are in place. So during this COVID-19 physical distancing, what can organizations do? Organizations can continue educating on suicide prevention, covering the following. Know the signs, warning signs of someone contemplating suicide. What should people be looking for? And what warning signs, and that warning signs are always to be taken seriously. Don't discount them due to the impression that they are not sincere or attention seeking. I like to say they aren't attention seeking, they are help seeking. Finding the words to offer support. Helping our community members know what to say to offer support what's helpful and not so helpful. Education about the importance of asking the question. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Or are you having thoughts of hurting yourself? Or have you wished you could go to sleep and not wake up in the morning? Asking the question is essential for suicide prevention. Then reaching out teaching our community members on the action steps to take when worried about someone. After asking the question, seeking professional resources and don't leave them alone and follow up with them if appropriate for further connection. Wellness, educating on tips for increasing their overall wellness, how to be healthy and active. Connection, helping our community members explore ways to connect with others in this time of physical distancing to ensure that it's not social isolation. And lastly, stigma. Messages and education to normalize help-seeking behaviors and talking about suicide and mental health. How can we do this in the current COVID-19 world? Connectedness is all about the connections a person has among family, friends, peers, and community. How connected people are to health and social services and how well services collaborate. We want to make sure that as prevention professionals, we are connecting with the community and providing needed resources. With everyone staying home and engaging in physical distancing, more and more people are spending more and more time online. Therefore, more people are looking to connect with others online as well as finding opportunities to engage in activities. So take advantage of technology during this time of physical distancing. 
Connecting with your communities and getting them to connect with their own social supports will help buffer against social isolation. Here is a list of virtual delivery options. Webinars. Provide information for professional development for your local prevention professionals. Look for webinars that are available from reputable organizations that you can help promote to your community. More and more opportunities are coming out every day. Conduct virtual town hall meetings and or virtual planning meetings. Provide programs virtually. Looking at your programs that are in your action plan and identifying ways to provide them, pro provide the information virtually if possible. Take advantage of the programs that have approved online delivery as resources, such as QPR, Sources of Strength, and CAST. Social Media Awareness Campaign. Putting together a campaign strategy to address your target population and educate them about suicide prevention and connectedness. You could, in addition to the strategies above, create videos that provide information from your program lessons or curriculum and or suicide prevention information. This allows people to view them when they can and even multiple times. It also allows them to share the information to others, which increases your reach and your organization's presence online. Set up a calendar of topics to cover each week with your posts focusing on suicide prevention awareness, such as knowing the signs, finding the words, reaching out, wellness, connections, stigma. When using social media, there are guidelines on how to do it effectively and in a safe manner. Anytime we are educating on suicide and suicide prevention, these safe messaging guidelines are essential to follow. The do's, practice, practices that may be helpful in public awareness campaigns. Do emphasize help seeking and provide information on finding help. When recommending mental health treatment, provide concrete steps to find help. Inform people that help is available through the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and through established local service providers and crisis centers. Do emphasize prevention. Reinforce the fact that there are preventative actions individuals can take if they are having thoughts of suicide or know others who are or might be. Emphasize that suicides are preventable and should be prevented to the extent possible. Do list the warning signs as well as risk and protective factors of suicide. Teach people how to tell if they or someone they know may be thinking of harming themselves. Messages should also identify protective factors that reduce the likelihood of suicide. Do highlight effective treatments for underlying mental health problems. The impact of mental illness and substance use disorders as risk factors for suicide can be reduced by accessing access to effective treatment and strengthened social support in an understanding community. Let's now talk about unsafe messaging, things we should not do when educating or posting about suicide prevention. Don't glorify or, rom or romanticize suicide or people who have died by suicide. Vulnerable people, especially young people, may identify with the attention and sympathy garnered by someone who has died by suicide. They should not be held up as role models. Don't normalize suicide by presenting it as a common event. Although significant numbers of people attempt suicide, it is important not to present the data in a way that makes suicide seem common, normal, or acceptable. Most people do not seriously consider suicide an option. Therefore, suicidal ideation is not normal. Presenting suicide as common may unintentionally remove a protective bias against suicide in the community. 
don't present suicide as an inexplicable act or explain it as a result of stress only. Presenting suicide as the inexplicable act of an otherwise healthy or high achieving person may encourage identification with the victim. Additionally, it misses the opportunity to inform audiences of both the complexity and preventability of suicide. The same applies to any explanation of suicide as an understandable response to an individual's stressful situation or to an individual's membership in a group encountering discrimination. Oversimplification of suicide in any of these ways can mislead people to believe that it is a normal response to fairly common life circumstances. Don't focus on personal details of people who have died by suicide. Vulnerable individuals may identify with the personal details of someone who died by suicide, leading them to consider ending their lives in the same way. Don't present overly detailed descriptions of suicide victims or methods of suicide. Research shows that pictures or detailed descriptions of how or where a person died by suicide can be a factor in vulnerable individuals imitating the act. Clinicians believe the danger is even greater if there is a detailed description of the method. When doing a suicide prevention social media campaign, it's essential to recognize when someone responding to your posts is at risk and have a procedure for responding to get them to professional help. One of the first hurdles to cross in establishing a process for suicidal community members is one of identification. How do you know if someone may be in a suicidal crisis? People often express one or more warning signs before attempting suicide. In general, a person expressing one or more of the following warning signs in a comment, message, profile, or post online may be considering suicide. Talking about wanting to die or kill oneself, looking for information about methods, talking about feeling hopeless or having no reason to live, talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain, talking about being a burden to others, people are better off without me, increasing use of alcohol or drugs, acting anxious or agitated, behaving rec recklessly, Withdrawing or feeling isolated, showing rage or talking about seeking revenge. Displaying extreme mood swings, expressed a heightened fixation with death or violence. Risk factors are characteristics that may make it more likely that an individual will consider an attempt. However, they can't cause or predict an attempt. If any of the following risk factors are expressed in conjunction with the above warning signs, this person may be at considerable risk of suicide. Stressful life events such as the death of a loved one, divorce, or job loss. Prolonged stress factors such as harassment, bullying, social humiliation, relationship problems, or unemployment. Easy access to lethal methods including firearms or drugs prior suicide attempts, and or prolonged history of self-harming behaviors, barriers to access health care and treatment, social isolation and or alienation. Next, we will discuss social media tips, including what to do if someone is at risk online. Identify what team members have the time and approval to access your social media platforms to post and respond to content. Stick with a consistent team to ensure your voice remains the same. Outline topics that are allowed to be posted, the approval process, technology that can be accessed to respond and post, and crisis content steps and, re and actions to take when a user posts suicide-related messaging. So the third one is very important. So let's take time now to go over it in more detail about the response plan. That is, it, it is vital 
way to prevent suicide. It's important to plan ahead for how to respond to suicidal posting. Who will monitor the conversation? How often? What resources will you provide to visitors who post suicidal content? What support will you provide to staff who respond to such postings? Here are a few suggestions. Post text that alerts visitors that your site is not a substitute for contacting a crisis center. Provide resources and of, a, of an appropriate phone number and or website. Create standard responses that can be used to reply to a message that appears to require immediate response to support someone in need of suicide prevention support. Set up your smartphone devices with the tools you will need to manage your social media accounts on the go. So you'll be able to manage any crisis posts that may arise. Contact the social media safety teams to report suicidal content. Facebook has teamed up with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline to help bring emergency counseling services to members in need. Here is an example. If you are in crisis, please call 1-800-273-TALK or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. This page is not monitored 24-7 and is not intended for crisis intervention or you can direct them to your community's crisis line if you wish. The point is to make sure that crisis resources are readily available and people know that the site is not monitored, monitored constantly and not intended to be crisis intervention. This is an example of a message to post as a comment to be viewed by the public. If you feel that life is not worth living, please call National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. The call is free and confidential and crisis workers are there 24 seven to assist you. To learn more about the Lifeline, visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. What do we do if someone expresses suicidal intent online? Here's an example of language you can use. We are concerned for your safety and would like to offer help. The trained counselors at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline are available 24 seven by calling 1-800-273-TALK. The call is free and confidential. We hope that you can remain safe and continue to reach out. Please do not do anything to hurt yourself. To learn more about Lifeline, visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Someone may be responding to a post because they are concerned about a friend who has expressed suicidal intent. This is an example of language to use to respond. Thank you for reaching out and caring about your suicidal friend. Feel free to call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK yourself so that you can find out what resources are available in your area. Most importantly, please encourage your friend to call us. Now back to the other social media tips. Select which social media strategies is right for you. There are so many different social media platforms to choose from blogging sites, video sites, social networking sites, as well as forums, email, text messaging, and video chat. The most commonly used social media community-driven platforms are Facebook and Twitter. Develop fresh and engaging content. It is advisable to create a spreadsheet that outlines the date something is targeted to be submitted and the message content or topic. The spreadsheet can be used as a tool to route the, to those responsible for signing off on posting content. Track posts and responses. The spreadsheet developed for the approval process can be used for tracking purposes simply by adding when something was posted, actual content posted, who posted it, and how people responded. Speak in layman's term. Post content in a conversational style. Avoid using industry terms and jargon. Here are some basic principles of plain language. Quickly engage the reader. Write in an active voice. Keep messages short. Write in a friendly but professional tone. Choose familiar terms and use them consistently. 
engage with the users. Engaging and responding in a timely fashion is expected with social users. Social users do not like phony personalities. Make sure your voice is genuine. Social media is a give and take medium. Follow communication streams among your social users and offer resources when they are inquiring you to. Your network and social support and prevention in general. Monitor post engagement. Each post should be monitored for user engagement and feedback. Likes, comments, and shares should be taken into account in deciding whether or not your users find a particular posting interesting or beneficial. Determining the amount of likes, comments, and shares that render a post successful should be monitored. Monitor effectiveness. Once you determine your communication objectives and specific social media tactics, you can determine how best to evaluate the process, outcomes, and impact of your social media efforts. So tips for connecting while social distancing but I like to say physical distancing. Now in the time of this distancing with COVID-19, people, including us, need reminders that most of us know how to bond with others and make those connections. We need now to think of how to do this through technology rather than face-to-face. -face. So I wanted to spend the next few minutes on tips for connecting. These are ideas and by no means an exhaustive list of how to engage in connectedness activities as well as possible ideas to push out to your communities. People need a reminder to stop, breathe, and connect during times of stress. So let's look at different areas for connection. There are several areas of our lives that we can connect. All are important and vital. Now we will review a few tips for our community members and ourselves to connect with family, friends, neighbors, culture, ourselves, in order to stay active and engaged. Let's start with connecting to family and friends. Right now is a great time to connect with family members and friends near and far. Call, Skype, FaceTime, Zoom with loved ones. This increases connection when you can not only talk to them, but see them. Look at photo albums and discuss family heritage. Create a family tree. Write letters or create cards for loved ones. Perhaps an overdue thank you note for that really nifty gift you received. Our social circles often serve as our greatest system of support, and there's plenty to do in lieu of usual face-to-face -face activities. Go outside and greet neighbors and passerby from a safe distance. Play cards or board games. Do arts and crafts together. Write stories and poetry and then read them aloud. And give lots of encouraging applause, please. Read stories virtually. Every day I go on Facebook and my kid's kindergarten teacher is putting recordings of her reading a book to her students so they can stay connected to her. It's amazing. Start or join an online book club. Create and send your loved ones a video of you sharing a message of connection. This can be used as a nice substitute for a video phone call if they weren't available when you called. If you are able, you could put together care packages for those in need inside and outside of your social network. And my favorite, have a virtual dance party. Host a virtual meal. We know that meal times are such an amazing opportunity for bonding, so do it virtually. You could talk and bond over the meal. You could even share recipes, therefore sharing the same meal. Attend a virtual concert, church service, or class. Play an online game together. Watch a movie together. Streaming services are now putting out ways to connect to each other and watch the movie. Connecting with culture. With many schools closed and parents working from home, this is a great time for you and your children to connect with your culture as well as cultural institutions. 
read books about your culture, cook a meal together that reflects your cultural heritage, or virtually visit more than 1,200 museums around the world via Google Arts and culture. Connect with yourself. Confronted with the constant barrage of information, uncertainty, and day-to-day -day realities of caring for children, family, and loved ones, it is critical to find ways to connect with yourself. Here are a few. Meditate or do yoga. Journal or read. Exercise. Get good sleep. Eat healthy. Let light in. We need sunlight, so make sure you get sunlight every day. Have self-compassion. Be kind to yourself and understand that these are difficult times. Stay connected. Engage in some of the activities we just reviewed to ensure that you stay connected. Tips to manage stress and anxiety. Temper your expectations and be kind to yourself. Remember, most of us were not prepared for this. Anxiety, fear, worry, and grief, these are all normal reactions to an abnormal circumstance. Laundry piles, dirty dishes, messy rooms, do what you can. And while we always suggest monitoring your, the use of your children's screen time, both how much and what they are watching, this may be a time where children have more screen time than they are accustomed to. Just make sure that your children are practicing safe online behavior. Embrace a rigid state of flexibility. Most people of all ages thrive when they have predictable routines. If your children are preschool age or older, have them participate in the development of a daily schedule. And when, not if, the schedule gets derailed, see tip one above and be kind to yourself. It's okay. Find ways to stay informed. There is a constant barrage of barrage of information regarding COVID-19, and it is challenging to know what to think. Find trusted sources and limit your exposure to this material. Talk with people you trust about your concerns and how you are feeling. Learning. Learning can be fun. With uncertainty about the return to school, many parents are fretting about the potential loss of academics for their children. Fortunately, daily activities carry immense opportunities for learning. Cooking teaches science and math. Yard work teaches about nature and can inspire creative art projects. Reading together enriches vocabulary and listening skills. But don't forget about yourself. Is there something you want to know more about or a skill you want to learn? Every day, more and more free online classes are being offered take advantage of them. And as we already mentioned, engage in self-care. Take deep breaths. Stretch or meditate. Try eating healthy, well-balanced meals. Exercise. Get plenty of sleep and avoid alcohol and drugs. Make time to unwind. Try to do some other activities you enjoy. During this time of uncertainty, be certain in your knowledge and abilities to educate your communities about suicide prevention. You can do this. You just may need to think outside the box and get more comfortable with technology. I want to thank you for your time today, and I hope this was helpful. I'm going to show my resources in a moment, but also want you to know that more resources to use during this time will be added to the Athena Forum. Athena Forum, <laughs> so watch out for those. Now let's open this up for discussion and questions. One of the questions that we have is a poll first of knowing who needs to have community or continuing education hours. So I'm gonna launch that poll now. What? Oh. 
if I can figure out how to do it. I may need Billy to do it. Oh, they do it. <laughs> can you tell that I need to become more comfortable with technology too? Is there a way to open it again? All right, so if you still needed, because of my lack of knowledge of technology, which I'm working on, if you still need to let us know about your community education hours that you need, my contact information is um, available to you. So now let's open it up for discussion. So it looks like 68% of you said, yes, you need to have your community health hours. All right, Billy, do we have any questions? All right, so I'm not hearing any questions. One of the things that is a possible topic to discuss is Dr. Kilmer brought up the comment of calling it physical distancing rather than social distancing. And that language has a lot of power. And I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say about that. Billy, can you unmute people so they can speak? If people would like to raise their hands, then we can unmute you. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yes, we can hear you. This is Meadow Meter. I'm calling from Waukeacom County. Um, in the sudden change in uh, events, I am becoming more of a social media expert than I really am. And looking for content um, that's geared towards not only suicide prevention, but uh, teen suicide prevention. Um, where would you recommend finding a lot of content in order to, uh, I'm the, the platform I'm using the most right now is Instagram, but I'm trying to also integrate our county's Facebook page. So I was just wondering if you have any tips on finding content uh, in regard to suicide prevention and suicide prevention in teens. And thank you, this has been really informative. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I do have the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, SPRC online, has a lot of different um, guidelines and booklets and even video trainings of, regarding social media and suicide prevention for all different types. So that's where I would suggest starting first um, because there's a lot of information there. I don't know if anybody else knows of any other resources off the top of your head. Would you mind repeating the name of the Suicide Prevention Resource Center? Is that dot org? I believe so. But if you just Google Suicide Prevention Resource Center, it will come up. SPRC. Thank you very much. Another place might be the American Association of Suicidology. Do we have other questions? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, hi. Hi, this is Peggy in Walla Walla. And um, I just wanted to share that um, I posted a great article from the Washington Post about um, what you just mentioned on social distancing. It's, um, is social distancing the wrong term? Experts prefer physical distancing um, and the World Health Organization agrees. So that's a really great article for people to look at um, as far as the terminology. But I did have a question because I reached out to Department of Health as well, is that is either state agency doing anything um, around um, commercials or prevention, um, suicide prevention um, amidst the COVID, like PSAs or anything that could be used and shared statewide. Um, you know, we're, we're feeling a lot of anxiety, um, especially, you know, um, not just kids, but in our workforce. Mm -hmm. And um, I just didn't know if I asked DOH the same thing. I go, have you guys anything that we can put on around mental health? Everything so far has been on physical health. So just a question. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think all of us are feeling anxiety, which is a normal reaction to our, certain, our situation right now. And yes, the HCA and the health department are working on putting together a campaign uh, for mental health. Um, I, I don't know exactly when it's going to be launched, but I do know that they're working on it. Um, do you know if it'll be done in English and Spanish, both? I don't know that off the top of my head, but I can find out. So. Okay. And then when that um, becomes available, you'll get it out to all of us to be able to, to share, I hope. <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll let you know as soon as it launches. and. Okay. Uh, make it available for you all. OK, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Jen, are you able to add that website resource into the um, chat box for everyone? We've had that question come in a couple times. 
for the Suicide Prevention Resource Center? Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, please. I'll put it in there. So one of the questions I have, I have for you guys is, what have you been doing for yourself to stay socially connected? While folks think about that, there's another question that's come in that asks, can we implement mental health first aid training online? So uh, the National Council has come out and said that they do not recommend doing mental health first aid online. Hey, Jen, this is Billy. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, hey, look at that. Sorry, I got muted somehow. and. Took a minute to get back on. Well, we're glad you're here. <laughs> and so uh, just to add to that youth mental health first aid question, we did hear from a couple of our trainers that the National Council is actively working on that, uh, but it's not available yet uh, as an online offering. Um, and so timeline wise, it might not be helpful to keep an eye out because they may be fast tracking some of that work. Uh, so I would en encourage you to keep an eye on the mental health first aid websites to see uh, if and when those things become available uh, remotely. Thank you, Billy. Am I still unmuted? Hello? Yes, you are. Okay, thanks. Um, I just, this is Peggy again in Walla Walla. And, you know, um, we've been working on the QPR um, programming, and it is really um, actually been very beneficial looking at the amount of school districts within our area um, that would, some that would want the gatekeeper training, some that are a little bit more advanced that offer clock hours for school nurses. I have um, also, there's specific for coaching. So it does give an option for, um, you know, that's you know, maybe three or four hours, which is really kind of cool. So I would encourage people to look um, look at the QPR website and really look at what all is available. Um, Cause I've had a really good response from both my counties that are um, involved with our suicide prevention grant this year. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions coming in, Billy? Uh, there's no other questions in the chat box at the moment. I see two hands still up. So Peggy, your hand is still up. I assume that was because you just spoke. And then uh, looks like Meadow Meter, your hand is up, but has been for a while. So if I don't see it go down, I can take you off a of mute. Oh, there it goes. So I am not seeing any hands anymore. And I'm not seeing any questions in the question box at the moment. Okay. Well, again, I want to thank you all for taking the time today. Uh, to spend with us and going over this material. And again, I just want to encourage you to think about yourself and self-care as you are taking care of your communities and engage in some of these connectedness activities yourself. And again, remember to breathe and stop at times to do that self-care. So thank you so much for being here today. More resources will be available on the Athena forum. And again, DBHR is always here to help support you. So contact your manager with any further questions or you can contact me. Thank you, everybody.